many of the world's great turbulent outcrops are found in mountain belts, and the classic Anot system is no exception. Lies in southeast France on the edge of the Western Alps. On the map, it's shown by these mustardy colours, and work to date has concentrated on the area of Provence at the bottom of this map, where the tectonic deformation is rather light. We're going to do something rather different here. The motivation for this study is that understanding the system scale informs understanding of sediment transport elsewhere, and it also informs the tectonics. But we'll see, this is going to involve meeting something of a challenge. So let's set the scene a bit. This is Joseph and Lomas's view of the Anot system, sourced from the south from a landmass and shed um, northwards in a foredeep to the Alps, running north towards the basement massif of the Ekras shown in the pink on the, well, on both maps. So here's Joseph and Lomas's block diagram looking back up the system. We can use this to identify some of the stratigraphic elements. So the Idealized stratigraphy of the Anot system is it's part of the 4D mega sequence, which begins with a limestone that transgresses a tectonized substrate. The Anot sandstone lies above this and is capped by a debris flow, a listostrome, and then by an overriding thrust sheet. So that defines the 4D mega sequence here in the late Eocene, the Ligocene. The block diagram also shows their idea that the depositional system is confined by tectonic structures, folds on the basin floor, which provide sinuous corridors along which the turbidity currents flowed, and also by an advancing thrust system uh, coming in from the left-hand side of the block diagram, which is the arriving alpine chain. Well, there are two questions we want to ask, and we're going to go to this area uh, in the box because According to Joseph and Lomas, the turbidite system banked up against the Ekran, which essentially on a large scale ponded it within the foredeep. They also argue that the turbidite basins were closed off by the advancing Alps themselves. So let's go up to the eastern Champsor area, just on the southern flank of the Ekran. Here we are on that flank, and let's add some geology. So we've got the basement on the left, forming going up to make high ground in the clouds, and the turbidites the, um, banking up against that basement. So here's a simplified geological map of that area. And we've got the basement in the pink over there on the, on the northwest side of the map, and it forms the high ground that you can see in the photograph. And the uh, anot and age equivalent turbidites are shown in the mustard color with the box, little box in the middle of the map being the view we just looked at. Now, the study that, we, that uh, we're going to look at today builds on some earlier work, and that work was by Jamie Vinnels, who, um, who did his PhD on this ground that we published uh, 10 years ago now, and it shows the idea of, tu of turbidity currents flowing across um, from the basin across onto the basement. So the basement massif was not a dam, the paleo flow continues towards the basin massif and runs up, runs up and presumably continued across it. So we're going to look at the area where those paleo currents sit, and the next map is essentially of that area. Here it is. So the turbidite basin is in yellow. We're going to add detail to this uh, as we go. And there are two basement inliers in there shown in red. Now let's go and have a look at some of the challenges we're going to try and face here. And we're going to look at the southern hillside uh, to that northern basement inlier just there here it is a nice hillside let's add some scale so we're looking at way over a kilometer of relief in here and now let's add some geology the lower part consists of the crystalline basement inlier we've then got a veneer of the early four deep limestone coming over the top what about the turbidites there you go lots of folds coming through here. We can trace out the major axial surfaces with the um, red lines through this. So the challenge is to see through the deformation to understand what the basin architecture looked like. Now, there have been studies of deformed basins in the past. The key point we want to talk about is the workflow. So documenting workflows explicitly is important because it allows understanding of where the uncertainty, assumptions, and limitations of any particular 
um, study and in and the interpretations that derive from it um, may come from. So our workflow would goes like this. And so we start with the strike section. There's a, about 1500 meters relief in here, so it's a big section. We can use the accessible parts of the hillsides to build logs, and these are rather analogous to wells in subsurface investigations. The hillside then becomes essentially equivalent to a seismic section, and we can correlate between the logs, we can fill in the areas that we can map directly, and we can tie up other parts of the stratigraphy based on their bed set character seen on the cliffs. The next step is to swing out and tie this into the more obviously deformed sections. So now let's just look over our left shoulder. Here's the hillside. We can look at the scale of that. This time we've got almost two kilometers of relief in here. And we can map the top basement surface like this. And we can pick out the bed sets and the boundaries of them through the fold structures like this. We can test these correlations um, and add further information by tying in further logs as we go. So that hillside uh, is the boxed area that's on the map there that we've just been looking at. So we've got um, essentially large hillsides that provide correlations akin to seismic data. And we can then use that, of course, to build out a map um, through the area like this, where we divide the stratigraphy into different bed set units picked out by those different colors. You'll notice that straight away we can recognize discordance between those and the light blue, which is the earlier part of the four deep sequence in here, um, on lap essentially of the turbidite systems onto those earlier four deep deposits. So that was the workflow. Now let's look at the stratigraphy that we can derive from it. We can start off looking at that first section that we looked at on the strike section. Here are the logs from those areas there tied together to make a composite. The yellow is the sand, so we can divide the units up into different packages based on their net to gross. And we can correlate them through the area. So here is the correlation through all the logs that we've, that we've uh, provided. And it shows um, variations in net to gross through the, through the area. They're tied from cliffs. They're not just jump correlated between what would be the wells. Let's have a look at some of the rocks. Here are the, there's an upper part of the sand, a fairly typical section with these thick sandstones. Hard to get the scale from this view. So let's look at one of them. So we're looking at sort of four to five meters of sand in a single event in here. Um, fairly uniform actually. And then if we uh, zoom in on some of the typical um, bed tops around here, we can see that they're, they're abrupt, um, indicative of lots of bypass, even here, in this area fairly far down the Alot system. So that was a snapshot of some of the stratigraphic information. Of course the area is deformed so let's look at the cross sections through here. So we, I'll show you two cross sections that tile on the main ridge lines through the area. Um, we're looking south so the Alps is over on the left hand side coming in where the X dash and Y dash are and the folds verge towards the foreland and we're seeing various units through here correlated through the folds uh, in simplified fashion. Notice the pinch out of A1 against the blue rocks which are the pre uh, the pre early 4 deep units so we can see some of the onlap on here. The neat thing about the deformation is it provides more section length in the areas than an underformed basin will, and it provides different samples of the depth through the stratigraphy. So actually it's our friend in this to provide more information on the stratigraphy than we would otherwise get if this was undeformed. What we can do now is try and unravel the fold. So this is, this is a version at the top here of the lower cross section, tracking bed thicknesses with those uh, bed or perpendicular stripes, and we can unravel it to show the restored section. Now it's it, the restored section is just pull, pulling the beds out, a so-called line length restoration. And it generates artifacts, which are all the little bumps at depth. It's a difficult problem, this, because there's a trade-off between bed thicknesses that were original due to stratigraphy versus those that are due to deformation. So uh, in removing the artifacts, you may lose stratigraphic information. So we've left them on for now so you can get the general feel. What we can see on this cross-section and its restoration is the onlap, but we can get a, an, a, a reasonable approximation to the overall style, which is it's 800 meters of onlap over about a distance of 11 kilometers or so. 
but also it's it's quite a jerky type of onlap. So the places where the onlap is abrupt and other places where the stratigraphy is more or less conformable and then more more onlap. Um, there are also apparent thickness variations and changes in stratigraphy, which almost certainly relates to growth of deformation structures in the substrate during deposition. So this block diagram takes our first pass set of interpretations from the Champsoy area and ties it back into the Joseph and Lomas model for confined uh, turbidity currents in the Anarch system. It shows that the basin floor is actively deforming to, find, to provide the confining structures, as is an advancing thrust sheet shown in green, the Umbrenio binaps, and the debris flows that are being shed off it in the grey there. So the idea is that the um, alloctan is providing an important part of the confinement to the overall turbidity system. Here's the debrite. It's uh, one of the best examples of the, the so-called schister block fasces anywhere in the Western Alps, is in the Champsoy area. And there, the idea is that it should have occluded the, the sand fairways as the turbidity currents were coming in. So if the alloctan and its listosterone were coeval with the turbidites, which is required if it's going to act to confine the turbidite, then the, the turbidites and the elistosome should interbed. Well, if you look at our logs for the Champsoy area, we can see that it doesn't. The uh, elistostrome level is unique. It lies and caps the entire turbidite system. It is, does not interbed with the sandstones. So they're not coeval. The turbidite system must shut down before the arrival of the thrust sheets and its related debris flows. So here's our revision of the Joseph and Lomas uh, block diagram. It shows the source area in the south still, and it shows the turbidites uh, rooted along sinuous corridors that are defined by folds in the substrate. And those um, folds continue to the basement massif that forms the side end of this block diagram. Structural confinement towards the Alps is not provided by a thin-skinned uh, alloctonous thrust sheet, but by thick basement rooting structures. But the system doesn't finish there. It continues to flush northwards uh, into another basin uh, beyond the Ekran, further north again. It's an area known as the Agi Uh This is a, a quick snapshot of that area. Still a very sandy uh, system, even this far down the Anot. And the question is, where are the finds? Where is the ultimate sink for this? Uh, and that's yet to be discovered. So to conclude, let's step back. The tectonic structures are fundamentally important in controlling sediment routing through these systems because they provide the sinuous corridors and hence control the behaviour of the turbidity currents in terms of whether they behave as confined or unconfined flows, contained or uncontained. The deformation is distributed over a broad area into the four deep, into the alpine chain. So there's no real distinction between a four deep area and a wedge top. There's, it's just a continuum of different deformation states and thrusting through the area. This opens up a range of different possibilities for sediment pathways and routes uh, in these sorts of systems. An interesting question to ask is whether the turbidity currents are tuned to this tectonic style so that they're always on the point of bypass allowing sediment to flush down the system to the far end without having incision along the way. That's a question for the future. Interestingly, the deposition also controls the thrust trajectory in emergent systems. And you can find out more about that and other systems which are tectonically controlled in some of our other work. But there's still lots to be done about how structures and depositional processes work together in these synorogenic basins.